out. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is the Musar class at Maganyashianu Synagogue, and Ms. Batya is not here with us tonight. She's on vacation, a well-earned and deserved vacation. Hope I saw pictures of feet in the sand, so I'm hoping they're having a blast. Um, so it's just we're just doing the windows to the soul tonight. Uh, the author is Rabbi Michael Bernstein, and he's a medical doctor as well. He's actually a psychiatrist. Um, so it's kind of interesting that both of the books that we've been studying this, uh, this time around, they have this psychological aspect to it, as well as the rabbinical aspect. And I, I, to me, it's just really cool. I'm loving it. So this week's Torah portion is um, Parashat Korach. And many of you who've been with us for a while know the story of Korach but essentially if you don't this the whole thing was that Korach was Moses's cousin and he felt that Moses had elevated himself far too much above everybody else I mean we're all Levites anyways right so why is Moses get to have a fun job so a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight has to do with this fella Korach there's only it's a very small chapter but there are uh, three sections and <laughs> um, yes, Miss Devora, it is worth hearing it again too. So the first section is what Moses heard. Okay, so he starts off saying that on more than one occasion, the Jewish people had beleaguered Moses in the desert with complaining vociferously about lack of water, meat, and other provisions, right? But um, it's with Korach though, it's the first time that somebody ever challenges Moses' authority. And Moses' reaction to this was, was unusual. In chapter 16, verse four, it says, and Moses heard and fell on his face. And our author is asking, what is the meaning of this reaction? What did, what did he hear? I mean, why did he fall on his face? At first glance, the words, and Moses heard, seem sur sur superfluous, <laughs> extra. <laughs> um, of course he heard. The guy was standing right there in front of him. Um, but the Torah never tells us that he heard with any of these other things. So why is, why is the Torah doing that here? And, and he goes on to say that according to several Midrashic sources, now get this, he, this is what he lists out. It's not just a few, okay? Sanhedrin 110a, Targan Yonasan, uh, Tankuma 10, Midrash Rabbah 18. In all of those, it talks about the, the, the Torah implies that Korach had slandered Moshe with charges of, adult, of adultery. Other sources and commentators, however, take the words at face value. So what did he hear? Perhaps the most common cause of rift and rebellion is the feeling of being ignored and disenfranchised. We see that a lot today on the news. Um, the feeling that no one is listening in fact, conflicts can very often be resolved by the simple act of attentive listening. Even when no solutions are offered, people will tolerate partial or inadequate solutions or even no solution at all as long as they and their complaints are validated, as long as they feel their concerns are being taken into account. Revolutionary wars have been fought because people felt they were denied representation. When Moshe saw that the people were in revolt, his first response was to listen carefully to the complaint of Korach and his followers. He showed them that he heard, that he understood their frustration. Regardless of the relative merits of Korach's complaint, Moshe conveyed importance to Korach by listening attentively. Then Moshe fell on his face in response to Korach's criticisms. That's chapter 16, verse three. 
that Moshe had exalted himself excessively above the congregation. The Orcha Chaim explains that by falling on his face, Moshe expressed humility rather than fear. Had Moshe really been driven by a desire for self and aggrandizement, even in a small way, he surely would have responded with an arrogant anger. By his humble response, Moshe demonstrated that personal ambition was not a part of his motivation. Although Moshe failed to quell peacefully the revolt that directly challenged his role as God's chosen leader, he demonstrated to all future generations the hallmark of leadership in the face of dissension and rebellion. So let's think about this a minute. Because the thing that stood out to me is the fact that people feel loved when they feel like they're heard. And as this is a Musar class, we're looking at this from the perspective of, you know, how can we balance our midot, right? So if we're looking at the midot of humility, well, Moshe gives us the example of that. If we're looking at the midot of chesed, loving kindness, well, how loved do you feel when somebody genuinely listens to your um whatever you're trying to say, whether you're trying to tell them what happened in your day or you're trying to express your opinion, when somebody genuinely listens to you, whether they agree with you or not, the fact that they listened makes you feel loved, included, accepted, that they care. And the fact that, that Moshe went to such extremes to make sure that people felt heard and then he showed that humility, that's huge. Okay, so the next section, huh, this one, I'm sorry, guys, but our author gets really deep here, <laughs> and I'm going to do my best to go over this, so I'm very sorry if I confused everybody. So this section is called recombinant etymology. So you hear word, these words often, I do, people talk about recombinant DNA, like, okay, just so that we know what this means, I went and found on Webster's Dictionary, what does recombinant mean? Recombinant means of or resulting from new combinations of genetic material. And I found that highly intriguing because we're talking about etymology and etymology means the development of, of language, right? So we're going to be looking at Hebrew and it's as kind of like a genetic DNA type of thing. Hold on just a second, everybody. I'm sorry about that. We had a little guy with some having, having some problems. Okay. So recombinant etymology. So he starts off talking about the book of creation, which is Sefer Hayatzara, states that before the world was created, God, God carved out 32 paths of wisdom. These are 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the 10 cardinal numbers. These are the channels through which the infinite wisdom of the creator flows to the world. So God's wisdom is flowing to all of us through those 22 letters and 10 numbers. Okay. Many ideas and yeah. concepts. Uh oh. Who's going to turn off the fan? Uh oh, mom, you uh -oh. need to Sorry. Um, mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Many ideas and concepts are associated with the forms and meanings of the individual letters. For example, the letters Dalit and Raish are similar in appearance, being opened on the left side, and the words they represent, Rosh and Dal, both refer to, the, to a needy person. But there is a difference. Okay, so this is the part you want to pay close attention to. A doll is needy in a sense that
that he yearns for greater spirituality, while a Rosh strives for material things. Okay, so keep that in your mind. The next one, our sages point out that the letters Hey and Kuf, which are next to Dalit and Resh, respectively, are both constructed in, by inserting a letter into the left side opening of Dalit or Resh. Inserting a Yud forms the Hey. Both Hey and Yud form God's name and are associated with spirituality. The insertion transforms the spiritual doll into the spiritual hay. Conversely, the letter kuf means monkey, a creature that mimics the physical physicality of humans, but not their intellect and spirituality. It is formed by inserting the letter Zayin into the open end of the Raish. The letter Zayin is associated with man's appetitive, sexual, and aggressive nature, his most animalistic aspects. Thus, this is the important part to hang on, the materially deprived Rosh connects with his animalistic drives. He becomes a monkey a caricature of a human being. Keep that in your mind. So we're gonna to add to that. Now let us observe what occurs when the Raish and the Dalit are combined with the letter Ayin, which means I. The Ayin, which has the numerical value of 70, is associated with the investigation and gathering of information correlating with the 70 sages who comprise the Sanhedrin, the high court. When an ayin is placed after a dalit, it forms the word da, which means knowledge. The spiritual seeker who investigates discovers knowledge. Okay, you guys see how these pieces are coming together? When it is placed after a resh, however, it forms the word ra which means evil or unstable. The seeker of pleasure finds evil. Okay. Well, here's the big wrap up. Moshe derides Korok's followers as wicked men in chapter 16, verse 26. The word used here for the wicked is rasha, which combines resh and ayin and also adds a shin, which connotes material abundance and completeness. The Rasha pursues and fills his material greed. And that's what Moses called Korok's followers. Let's not do that, what they do. <laughs> We, we want to be the guy who pursues the spiritual and we want to pursue the spiritual knowledge, investigate the spirituality of things and draw closer to Hashem, not the material world. Okay, so the third section is vanished without a trace. Faced with Korach's rebellion, Moshe declares to the Jewish people in chapter 16, verses 28 through 30. With this, you shall know that God has sent me to perform all these deeds, that it was not my own idea if Korak and his followers die as all men do. If they meet the fate of all men, then God did not send me. But if God forms a new creation and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them and, they, and all they possess, and they go down living into the netherworld, then you shall know that these men infuriated God. Wow. Why did Moshe make the, his vindication dependent on Korak dying such a bizarre death? Why couldn't he sim uh, say simply that if Korak dies a sudden death, it is proof that proof positive that he, Moshe, is the rightful leader. 
why was there a need for a new creation? Furthermore, why was it necessary for the earth to swallow all of Korok's possessions? Moshe wanted to demonstrate that challenges to the Torah and distortions of its concepts have no place in this world. God would obliterate Korok and his higher heretical view of Torah until not even the slightest vestige of anything connected with him or his identity remained in existence. The theme that there is no place in creation for those who seek to thwart God's will appears frequently in the Torah. God commands us to obliterate all traces of Amalek to blot out their remembrance. Likewise, God commands that we incinerate, lock, stock, and barrel, a city whose inhabitants have uh -oh. a city whose inhabitants have all practiced idolatry. When the Egyptians refused to let the Jewish people travel three days into the desert to worship God, he afflicted them with three days of a palpable darkness that immobilized them completely. The message was clear. Those who would block God's mission for the Jewish people might just as well not exist. I don't know about y'all, but I was like, wow. You know, we started off talking about how um, when you when you really truly listen to someone, they feel loved. And even if they're wrong and you're right, or you don't agree or whatever, that person feels loved and acknowledged. And we also talked about the um, kind of humility that a leader needs to have, right? Anybody needs to have really. Um, and we talked about, you know, the difference between a righteous man and a wicked man. And then God just kind of lowers that boom with bringing in that whole thing about having that fear of God, that fear of Hashem. If you're going to try to, to thwart God's plan, if you're going to try to distort his Torah, as far as he's concerned, you may as well not exist. Wow, it's huge. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I would love to hear what you all think about this because I'm still kind of feeling my hair is on fire. <laughs> so please feel free. Open up your mics and tell me what you thought. Come on, Ms. Devora, speak up. Can you hear me? Now we can. Oh, okay, there it is. Okay. Now, as I was reading this portion, there was a particular topic that I know what you down It's like you put it in my head. <laughs> anyway, as it pertains to Korok and that the spirit that Korok carries, and he kind of tweaked it to where it's like in there everybody that followed Korok went down with him. Mm -hmm. And that brought me to a I can't even tell you where it's at, but that brought me back to another scripture talking about bad association will spoil your uh well good habits. Yeah. What is that? Um when you hang around, was it yeah. bad company corrupts good character? That's the one. That's the one. Mm -hmm. And he was really driving that one home because I don't think a lot of time we don't think about that. Yeah. But who we associate with is a lot more important than what we realize. Yeah, it really is. Spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, just on the norm, you wouldn't really think anything about it. But if you really get on the spirituality, the spirituality of the matter, it could be detrimental. Yes. And, you know, again, there's a balance that we have to strike in there because, you know, you don't want to be too quick to judge someone. That's right. But at the same time, if they, you know, both Hashem 
in Torah as well as um, Yeshua Hamashiach both have said, you know, if if someone's going to do the wrong thing yeah. and they're not going to change, right. then wipe the dust off your feet and keep on moving, you yeah. know? But well, it's, it's, it's written to you that to know the right thing to do and you don't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, we really, man, we really need to use a lot of discernment. It's also been pointed out before um, in, in classes that I've listened to that it's interesting that the whole Korok situation comes right on the heels of the commandment to wear um, tzitzit. And what was the whole thing about the tzitzit? Do you guys remember from last week? It's about to remind you of God's commands so that you don't follow after what your heart and eyes distract you with, right? And then right after that command, we get Korok, <laughs> who, as we learned from our author, Moshe called his men uh, wicked men. And the word that he used there was the rasha, which combines resh and ayin, and also adds the shin, which connotes material abundance and completeness. The rasha pursues and fills his material greed. Right after we hear about wearing zit zit and putting that um, thread of tehillah in there to remind us of God's commands, this person who's all about having, you know, his pleasure and material greed, I think he was even compared to um, a monkey in the, the description of things. It's just like, you know, sometimes when we're wrong, we could be so wrong and not recognize that it's us who are wrong. And it can, that kind of arrogance can really <laughs> spiral down in a big fat way. And you're just like, oy vey, how did I get here now? Yeah. But yeah, um, that's, this is three small sections. I mean, but I was just like blown away. So I'm like, wow. I wish I had so much more understanding now of, of, of the Hebrew. I'm mm -hmm. like, sure, I'm even mean, I'm, I'm loving it and I will I want so much to know what this is. What does that mean? Yeah. How does that apply? And I'm like, what? I just, I want to know that so bad. Sometimes it's just frustrating. Well, I know that um, there are people in our, in our um, synagogue, Ms. Devorah, who, you know, have done a lot of studying of the letters and stuff. Like you could, you could ask Shira um, what book she used to study the letters. Yeah, but she mentioned um, she had started going through a book called uh, the Hebrew letters at the Hebrew outfit. Mm -hmm. uh, the wisdom of the Hebrew outfit. That's what it was. Yes. 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 She did go through that one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so that might be a good place to start. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't speak Hebrew yet. <laughs> I, I hope one day I can learn. <laughs> um, oh, Mr. Emma's here. Yay. Hi. He just missed it all, though. <laughs> <laughs> we could go over that section again just so Emmett could talk because I suspect he would have a lot to say on this part. <laughs> Emmett, give me a thumbs up if that's something that would be okay with you. <laughs> uh, yay, he gave us a thumbs up. All right, so we're going to read this one little section again. So for you guys who are just watching the video, this is so that I'm going to read this again so that we can have the benefit of Emmett's wisdom on this because this is kind of like, wow, okay, it's all about Hebrew letters and their numbers and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so this is the second section of the Korach Parasha from Windows to the Soul. It's called recombinant entomology. And recombinant means of or resulting from new combinations of genetic material. And entomology is the study of languages, how they develop, okay? So the book of creation, which is Sefer Hayatzara, states that before the world was created, God carved out 32 paths of wisdom. 
These are 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the 10 cardinal numbers. These are the channels through which the infinite wisdom of the creator flows into the world. Many ideas and concepts are associated with the forms and meanings of the individual letters. For instance, the letter Dalit and Raish are similar in appearance being open on the left side and the words they represent, Rosh and Dal, both refer to a needy person. But there is a difference. A doll is a needy is needy in the sense that he yearns for greater spirituality, while a rosh strives for material things. Um, our sages point out that the letters he and kuf, which are next to the dalit and resh respectively, are both constructed by inserting a letter into the left side opening of the dalit or resh. Inserting a yud forms the hay. Both the hay and the yud form God's name and are associated with spirituality. The insertion transforms the spiritual doll into a spiritual hay. Conversely, the letter kuf means monkey, a creature that mimics the physicality of humans but not their intellect or spirituality. It is it is formed by the ins by inserting the letter Zayin into the open end of the Raish. The letter Zayin is associated with man's appetitive, sexual, and aggressive nature, mo his most animalistic aspects. Thus, when the materially deprived Rosh connects with his animalistic drives, he becomes a monkey, a caricature of a human being. Now let us observe what occurs when the Rosh and the Dalit are combined with the letter Ayin, which means I. The Ayin, which has the numerical value of 70, is associated with investigation and gathering of information, correlating with the 70 sages who comprise the Sanhedrin, the high court, when the ayin is placed after dalit, it forms the word da, which means knowledge. The spiritual seeker who investigates discovers knowledge. When it is placed after a resh, however, it forms ra, which means evil or unstable. The seeker of pleasures finds evil. Moshe derides Korak's followers as wicked men in chapter 16, verse 26. The word used here for the for the wicked is raksha, which combines resh and ayin, and also adds a sheen, which connotes material abundance and completeness. The rasha pursues and fills his material greed. Okay, Emmett. So a lot of us are not very good at um, Hebrew. And I was reading this earlier thinking, wow, Emmett's gonna like this part. What do you what do you think about that part? Please um you can unmute your mic and speak. Well, it's basically using if you have the uh, diagram of the Hebrew letters, you can see this uh, mapped out better because that way you actually have like a visual guide to what it's okay. talking about but it's basically using the symbolism of each letter to explain the spiritual concepts that are connected to it and how letters can be morphed by adding other letters to them. And um, it, it basically speaks to really the fact of how creation was brought forth with the Torah, how, you know, you look at the, the paths of wisdom, you look at the 22 letters and things like that. So, um, other than it really just being very uh, symbolic through the pictures, uh, it it just speaks to that nature as far as the letters go. I'm not sure exactly if there was any uh, other things I saw besides just the beautiful illustrations of uh, transformation. Like, we know how the word transforms us, but it's interesting when you can go just zoom into the word like from a letter standpoint 
even the letters are transforming, not just the word itself, like the verses, the passages, the phrases, you know, you can, you can even see it in the letters. Hopefully that makes sense. It does. It makes a lot of sense. And when he wrote it out, he actually puts those letters in the parentheses so you can see what he's saying when you read the that um, that actually speaks to uh what rabbi mallet actually teached on this week earlier uh from shira shireen he was cool. talking about the way that the torah is a fractal and it's likened to a forest of trees so you'll see the forest and then you zoom in and you can start seeing the trees and then you zoom into the trees start seeing the branches zoom into the branches start seeing the leaves zoom into the leaves you start seeing branches within the leaves so you're doing this right now with the Hebrew letters to bring out these spiritual concepts and insights. Wow, I think it's so deep. I love this. And I think that the, the author calling this section recombinant entomology, because recombinant is all about mixing DNA. And the fact that this medical doctor, who's also a rabbi, <laughs> is calling it that, to me, it sounds... It, it alludes to that whole thing that everything that was made was made with these letters and numbers. That the that the alphabet, the language of Hebrew, everything it's it's the DNA of the whole world. If I could say one more thing to that, sure. This is the other concept that the Torah is likened to the mind of Hashem, and if we think about like our bodies, our bodies are made of DNA, so we're literally looking at DNA of Hashem mixing wow. his DNA with our DNA. Yes, and that's what recombinant means, is to mix DNA from different sources. This, this is the source of God, of course, but mixing his DNA with us, yes, completely. <laughs> Thank you. I knew you would have some really cool things to share when we got to that part. I'm so glad you finally came on. Totally love that. Thank you. Well, if anybody else has anything else to say, we've We've talked like, it feels like this one little tiny section, we've gone like the whole gamut from what it means to love somebody to what it means to be humble to what, what an evil person is to having that fear of God that ye raw. Because, you know, if you're going to try and change God's plan, you, you may as well not exist. That's what he said. So <laughs> if you guys came on late, please go ahead and read this because it was so deep and like, I still feel like my hair is on fire, but anyway, does anybody else have any comments or questions they would like to add? Okay. Well, then we're going to go ahead and end the um, video a little bit early tonight because we didn't have um, Ms. Spotya here. It was obviously getting her well-deserved vacation at the beach. I was so glad that they got to go and have a good vacation um but we'll be back next week at the same time and place so thank you for coming and we'll see you then and where is that record button stop recording